are uh, going to first hear from Megan Stewart, who is a clinical dietitian right here at Cedar sinai and the uh, Cancer Center. She has been here since 2010 and is a certified specialist in oncology nutrition. So she works with many of the neuroendocrine patients. And then we will have a delicious lunch. So please welcome Megan Stewart. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me and for including nutrition as part of this conference. I'm going to make this very concise, and if you have any questions at the end, um, feel free to ask me during lunch. Okay, so this is the disclaimer. Uh, nutrition is, um, there's not a one-size-fits-all for nutrition. It takes an individualized approach. Everyone has different needs based on their past medical history, based on their current um, symptoms or side effects from treatment. And so I do see patients here on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and if you are seeing a physician here, I can see you for nutrition therapy. So just get with me after, um, during lunch, rather. So different topics, I wanna to go over dietary guidelines for the neuroendocrine tumor patient, and review the diet for carcinoid syndrome, as well as go over uh, dietary restrictions for the HI, or 5-HII test, and review the low-fiber diet as a therapy for diarrhea and go over a couple supplements. So the dietary guidelines for the neuroendocrine tumor patient are basically the same as dietary guidelines for most people. You wanna have a plant-based diet, and this is going over the new American plate, which is replaced the USDA's food guide pyramid. So the goal with using the plate method is to look at the proportion of the plate that are plant-based foods versus animal-based foods. So ideally, two-thirds of your plate will be from animal pro or from plant-based foods, with one-third of the plate being from uh, protein. And that protein can be animal-based protein or plant-based protein, which we'll go over. Also, ideally, you want to have five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables per day, which can seem like a lot, but take a look at the serving sizes. And it's also not that much when you start uh, excluding or limiting processed foods or highly refined foods like white pasta, breads, things like that. So one question I get asked very often with patients is, you know, what do I need to eat? What's important for me? And protein is an essential nutrient. Uh, it's those with cancer tend to have higher protein needs. You can also have higher protein needs if you're undergoing chemotherapy, other treatments, or have undergone surgery. So looking at these different protein sources, you can choose animal or plant-based protein. Um, both are beneficial, it just it depends on your current situation and um, which foods you include in your diet. The protein is essential because it builds cells, tissues, and muscles. It also helps your body heal from cuts and wounds and surgery, and it helps build your immune system and build antibodies that protect you from disease. So with these animal-based proteins, you tend to want to choose the lowest fat options as possible, low or non-fat dairy, or if you eat meat, choose lean cuts of red meat. Um, you also want to include fish, which I'll go over in a minute, and fatty fish is actually beneficial. So Eating, those, um, eating fatty fish is very helpful. So we know that fatty fish um, are salmon, tuna, sardines, herring, and trout. Uh, these uh, protein sources do contain, pro um, excuse me, <laughs> do contain um, vitamins and minerals as well as are known for having a good source of vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids reduce inflammation in the body. They can also lower the risk of congestive heart disease and ischemic stroke and prevent oxidative damage and cognitive decline associated with aging and may improve memory in healthy adults. So for most people, the benefits of eating fatty fish outweigh the risks. The people that want to avoid or limit fatty fish because of mercury content would be women that are pregnant, are going to become pregnant, children, and um, and women that are breastfeeding. So the recommendation for fatty fish is to have two servings a week. And a serving is about 3.5 ounces, or about the size of a deck of cards. And another way that you can uh, reduce 
environmental toxin exposure from eating fatty fish is to remove the skin uh, prior to cooking the fish. A lot of the, the mercury is found in the skin of the fish. As well as choosing smaller fish like sardines or anchovies, they tend to have a lower mercury content than larger fish um, such as tuna. So other beneficial foods to include are probiotics and prebiotics. I think most people here are familiar with probiotics. Uh, the best source of probiotics are yogurt or kefir. Uh, kefir is similar to yogurt, uh, but it's a little bit more fluid and slightly effervescent. It can be found in the yogurt section of the grocery store. Uh, another good source is sauerkraut and kimchi also contain uh, good probiotics. And probiotics are live active cultures of bacteria. So these are the best sources. I see a lot of people advertise that sourdough bread is a good source of probiotics and it's not because it doesn't contain live active cultures. Other beneficial foods are prebiotics. Um, prebiotics contain fiber that the bacteria in your gut uh, feed on. So that's why these foods are beneficial. Uh, the picture for, let me see if this works. Mm, there we go. So this is a picture of chicory root. Chicory is the root of the endive plant, which is a leafy green. This is a good prebiotic source. Um, most people are familiar with chicory because it's in chicory coffee found in New Orleans at the like Cafe du Monde. That's not a good fiber source, but it is a use of chicory. <laughs> uh, you can also find this in uh, Fiber One bars, you'll see it in Kind bars and other um, protein bars as well as a fiber source. This is sunchoke, um, or also called Jerusalem artichokes. It's a great probiotic or a great prebiotic. And you, it's a root vegetable, so you prepare it the same way you would any root vegetable, such as potatoes. You can roast them. Mushrooms are also a good prebiotic. In addition to wheat bran, honey, leeks, garlic, uh, bananas, and asparagus are all beneficial for the gut. And the reason you want to include these foods in the diet is because they help with stool regularity. They also help uh, reduce cholesterol levels in the blood, and they can increase the amount of calcium, iron, and magnesium that your body can absorb from food or supplements. So I generally recommend uh, the probiotic-containing foods over probiotic supplements. So this was touched on a little bit earlier. There are certain foods that can exacerbate carcinoid syndrome and can contribute to the flushing and diarrhea, um, as well as difficulty breathing and rapid heartbeat. Um, so these are certain foods that have been shown to trigger these symptoms. Most commonly, it's large meals or tomatoes, alcohol, any spicy or fatty foods. Fatty foods would be foods that are fried or foods that have a high fat content, like cream-based soups. Those can be contributing foods to carcinoid syndrome. Raw vegetables can also be particularly irritating, as well as foods that contain amines. So this is a list of amine-rich foods. Not everyone that has carcinoid syndrome will be affected by these foods or have flushing and diarrhea after consuming these. Everybody is different. Um, these are just foods that have been reported to cause issues. Um, and I see some people taking photos with their phone to have a copy of this. I did bring a handout that's outside by the check-in desk if you want um, to grab one of those on your way out or during lunch, it's there and available. So one of the best methods for determining which foods are problematic is to keep a food diary. Write down what you eat, how much you ate, and when you had symptoms of carcinoid syndrome. And that can be very helpful in you determining which foods are causing the problem and can be helpful for any dietitian or other clinician that's working with you to determine which foods are causing an issue. So this was touched on a little bit as well by Dr. Fan. There are um, certain foods that you would need to avoid um, if you are taking the 5-IHAA urine test. Um, you would need to avoid these foods for 72 hours prior to the test. Uh, these are serotonin-rich foods, alcohol, and caffeinated beverages such as coffee, tea, Coca-Cola. Um, and I will have a list of those foods as well. That's also included on the handout. If you're taking the blood test, uh, you don't need to have any dietary restrictions. You just do need to fast for eight hours prior to the test. So these are a list of serotonin-rich foods that would need to be avoided for 72 hours prior to the urine test. 
So I want to go over management of diarrhea because it is a common issue for neuroendocrine tumor patients. There are many different causes for diarrhea. It can be related to the disease. It can be a result of carcinoid syndrome. It can be treatment related um, from different medications, surgery. Um, it can also be caused by lactose intolerance as well as um, infection and fat malabsorption. Um, fat malabsorption can commonly be caused by the drug um, octreotide. Other symptoms of fat malabsorption would be excess gas production, um, discolored stool, and even visible oil in the toilet bowl with bowel movements. So nutrition therapy for diarrhea is to follow a low fiber diet. And what this diet does is it eliminates foods that can be irritating to the GI tract and that can also cause water to be drawn into the GI tract. And includes foods that help to provide formed bowel movements, foods that are low in or high in soluble fiber. So you want to limit or avoid spicy foods, caffeine, alcohol, some of those high fat foods that we mentioned earlier, and as well as foods with a large amount of insoluble fiber, such as whole grains, dried fruit, dried beans. Um, broccoli and cabbage and any of these other foods from the cruciferous vegetable family. You know, for somebody that is having a lot of diarrhea, fluid replacement is very important. It's important to stay hydrated. Um, the recommendation is that each bowel movement of diarrhea that you have, you should drink an extra eight ounces of fluid to replace that loss. Some good examples would be water, uh, herbal teas, except for senna tea, um, which can actually cause diarrhea. Uh, you want to have diluted fruit juices or diluted sports drinks. So one thing you can do is just take water and pour it into a juice or sports drink to make it more hydrating. Uh, some good protein sources would be lean cuts of beef or pork, fish, tofu, and low-fat dairy, if you tolerate dairy. Oftentimes, people that do have uh, excessive diarrhea do develop a lactose intolerance, so it can be beneficial to avoid products such as milk, cream, and certain soft cheeses. And if you do have a lactose intolerance, you can often tolerate uh, yogurt or kefir that we mentioned earlier because the bacteria in those products breaks down the lactose and makes it easy for you to digest. So other good choices would be carrots, mushrooms, zucchini, beets, and some of these lower fiber fruits and vegetables. You know, oftentimes uh, people think that they need to follow this brat diet, bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast extensively, but I really find that it's useful if the diarrhea is very bad, and otherwise you can have other fruits and vegetables. Um, there are other ways to help manage diarrhea. Obviously, you know, talk to your physician about medication, whether it's over-the-counter or prescription medication that can be useful for managing the symptom. Uh, soluble fiber powders can also be helpful. Uh, some different examples are Metamucil, Citrusel, Benefiber. Banachol is another soluble fiber powder that also contains probiotics. And so what those uh, powders do is they help bind the stool together and give uh, formed bowel movements. Uh, probiotics can also be helpful. This is an example of uh, the kefir that we mentioned earlier. Um, and with the kefir and with the yogurt, I do recommend to have a plain and not flavored. So avoid the cherry flavor, strawberry, all of those because they do have a lot of added sugars. So if it's a little too sour in taste, try to put some fresh fruit with it and avoid the flavored product. Um, Nutmeg has also been shown to be helpful for diarrhea. Uh, the dose is about three um, teaspoons of nutmeg per day. And a way that you can consume that is to mix it into uh, smooth peanut butter, almond butter, and eat it on a cracker. So I want to exercise a word of caution um, with supplements. They can increase or decrease the risk of cancer. They can also interfere with medication and cancer treatment. Oftentimes they're advertised as natural and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're safe. Um, they're also not regulated by the FDA for their content, meaning that what is reported to be in the bottle isn't necessarily what is in the bottle. So you want to use extreme caution with supplements. So I'm just going to briefly go over um, two supplements that I hear about a lot. Um, niacin is the first one, or vitamin B3. Uh, carcinoid patients are at risk for a niacin deficiency. 
Um, they may have extensive weight loss, elevated serotonin levels, low food intake, poor appetite and flushing, and in which case sometimes a niacin supplement can be beneficial. Uh, another is also a symptom of niacin deficiency um, can be diarrhea as well as dermatitis and depression, um, which are also commonly associated uh, with carcinoid syndrome. So it can be f beneficial to take a niacin supplement. However, you want to be very, very careful when purchasing a niacin supplement and look for one that is 50 milligrams or less. Oftentimes these are sold in very high doses, 500 milligrams and even higher, and which can cause flushing. And this flushing is not the same as flushing that's associated with carcinoid syndrome, but anyone that's taken a high dose niacin supplement knows what I'm talking about and it's very unpleasant. Um, so with these, you want to take um, 25 to 50 milligrams twice per day. If you can only find the 50 milligram supplement, just cut it in half. Anyone that does uh, continue to have like a, some flushing when they take this can take half of a pediatric aspirin and that can reduce the flushing. So niacin is also found in the food supply. Um, most men need at least 16 milligrams per day and women need 14 milligrams per day. However, with carcinoid syndrome, this need is much higher. There is not an exact um, amount that has been established. So at the very least, I would recommend 35 milligrams per day, if not 100. But these are high niacin foods, so some ready-to-eat cereals that have been fortified with niacin, such as Total, Raisin Bran, foods like that, as well as chicken, tuna, rice, um, and some of these lower niacin foods. Uh, this is a supplement that I get a lot of questions about. I think it was most popularized on the Dr. Oz show, which doesn't give it much credibility, but um, <laughs> there are some, you know, it has been researched and shown that it may be, um, it may be beneficial in animal models. However, um, the trials are very small and, you know, really larger studies are needed to show that it's um, effective or beneficial for cancer patients. You know, and what I recommend is having whole fruits and vegetables. You know, when you take a product or a food like black raspberries and turn them into a powder, they've gone through extensive mechanical and heat processing to turn them into a shelf-stable powder. And a lot of nutrients are destroyed by that processing. So it is the most beneficial thing to eat a whole fruit or vegetable to get the beneficial properties from that food. This is my contact information, and I do have several handouts outside, including the, um, the My Plate from USDA and the Carcinoid Syndrome handout. Thank you.